warm up for today, please pause and answer the questions. Okay. This says a study aims to test the joint effects of chocolate and blueberries, both of which contain antioxidants, on brain function. A group of healthy individuals aged 20 to 35 is split randomly into groups. Each group is assigned to consume a certain type of chocolate, either none, one bar of milk chocolate, or one bar of dark chocolate, and a certain amount of blueberries, none or half a cup. My first question is, what are the factors? First of all, how many factors are there? There are two. Um, the factors are the type of chocolate. Oops, chocolate. And the amount of blueberries. I have two factors here. How many levels are there in the chocolate factor? There are three. I either get none, a bar of milk, or a bar of dark. And then in the blueberries factor, um, there are two levels, none or half a cup. Because of that, I have six possible treatments, and they are no chocolate, no blueberries, milk chocolate, no blueberries, dark chocolate, no blueberries, or no chocolate, half a cup of blueberries, milk chocolate, half a cup of blueberries, and dark chocolate, half a cup of blueberries. So every possible combination results in a treatment. The response variable is what I'm measuring at the end. It's a little nonspecific, but in general it says we're going to be measuring brain function. I would like something more specific than that, but that's okay. Okay, so so far we've only talked about completely randomized designs, okay, where I just entirely randomly assign individuals to treatment groups. We can improve on this in a couple different ways, and by improvement, I mean having a greater degree of control over the effects of lurking variables. The first improvement is a block design. A block is a group of experimental units that are known to be similar in some way that is expected to affect the response to the treatments. For example, if I think that sex is going to affect individuals' responses to treatments, if I think males are going to respond differently than females, then basically I'm going to take my experimental units and break them into males and females and then carry out the experiment separately in each block, which means the males are going to be randomly split up into the different treatment groups and then I compare their responses. And the females are going to be randomly split up into the different treatment groups and I'm going to compare their responses. This does not mean that all of the males go into one treatment group and the females go into the other. That's a terrible idea. Then I don't know if differences in the response are because of the treatments or because of male-female. Rather, I take the males and split them in half between the two groups, and I take the females and I split them in half between the two groups, or between the five groups or however many groups there are. Um, so suppose I am testing the effects of a certain intensive hair treatment on a simple random sample of 100 women. I have reason to believe that the treatment has different results depending on the woman's hair color. So I might use a block design here. I'm going to separate the women by hair color, then randomly assign the treatments within each hair color. Okay, so let's say I take all the women with blonde hair and I split them into three groups. One group uses the treatment every day, one group uses the treatment every other day, and the other group, the third group, doesn't use the treatment at all. Then I do the same thing with the brunettes, and with the women with red hair, and with the women who have black hair. Um, and I, it's like I carry out the experiment separately within each hair color. So in this example, the blocking variable, obviously, is hair color. So the question is, how do you choose your blocks? You're going to choose your blocks in order to reduce variability based on the likelihood that the blocking variable is related to the response. In that last example, I thought hair color was going to have an effect on response to the treatment. So that's what I blocked on. You're going to choose the most important, most unavoidable source of variability among the experimental units. This last bullet point should kind of be obvious. We do not randomly assign subjects to blocks. 
You don't randomly get put in the male group or the female group. You are male or female, and then I carry out the experiment separately um, in the male group and separately in the female group. Once I choose what I'm going to block based on, the block assignment should be automatic. Okay, so if I'm conducting some experiment in class and I decide to block based on what grade you're in, you don't randomly get assigned to a grade. You either are a sophomore, a junior, or a senior. So once I decide what I'm going to block on, the blocks should be automatic. Once I've blocked, I randomly assign the treatments within each block. Here's a diagram, okay, an experiment diagram that has blocking in it. I don't start with random assignment. I start by splitting the subjects into men and women. That's the blocking variable here. Then I randomly assign the men into three groups and the women into three groups. They go through three different treatments and then apparently the response variable here is survival, which is kind of morbid. There's a specialized form of blocking called matched pairs. Um, in a matched pairs design, we match subjects in various ways in order to produce more precise results than randomization. So in a matched pairs design, I can only have two treatments. And I end up forming two groups that are as closely matched as possible. And one treatment is assigned to each unit. I actually don't like calling them blocks because I think it's better to think of these as creating many blocks of size 2. Um, so I'm going to try and explain this a little bit better. This is like doing twin studies. I create pairs of twins. Um, maybe they're literally twins or maybe they're just as close to twins as I can, can form. So they're the same in terms of any characteristic I think may be important. Age, sex, height, weight, whether or not they smoke, whether or not they have a history of certain illnesses. So I create all these little twin pairs. Then I randomly split the twins between the two treatment groups. So I form two, uh, two different treatment groups that within the treatment group everybody's pretty different, but everybody has a twin in the other group. That way the two groups as a whole look as similar to each other as possible. An even more interesting way to carry out a matched pairs design is for each subject to be his or her own pair or his or her own twin. That means you get both treatments. A lot of the time this really isn't possible, okay? Um, but sometimes it is. And so each person actually gets both treatments and the order is what's randomized. For example, a study aims to test whether talking on a cell phone impairs a person's reaction time while driving. They're going to use a matched pairs design with each driver being his or her own pair. Because there are so many different variables related to driving, nobody really drives exactly like me except for me. So I'm going to be my own twin here. I'm going to complete a driving simulation, once while talking on a cell phone and once without. And what needs to be randomized here is the order. Whether I do the simulation with the cell phone first and then without it, or without it first and then with the cell phone. And the reason for that is maybe it takes a little bit of time to get used to the simulation. So I'm going to do a little bit better the second time. I don't want everybody to do better the second time if the second time is always without the cell phone. Then I don't know if they're doing better because they're not talking on the cell phone or because they're better at using the driving simulation. So if that order is randomized, it should affect both treatments equally. Some general cautions. Regardless of randomization, a good experiment relies on treating our units identically except for the allocated treatment. This is control, right? Everything else is the same except for the treatment. One way to help this is to use what's called a double-blind experiment. Um, I actually want somebody who is in AP Psychology or has taken AP Psychology to explain this idea to everybody. So pause the video and have some brave volunteer explain double-blindness to us.
Okay, hopefully we were able to do that. A double blind experiment means I don't know which treatment I'm getting and neither does the person who's administering the treatment or the person who's measuring the response variable. Let me give you an example of why this is important. Let's say, this is sad, but let's say I'm running some kind of drug trial on a new chemotherapy drug um, that is used in small children. Okay, and let's say half of these small children are receiving the real chemotherapy drug and the other half are receiving a placebo. How are you going to feel administering this drug to a patient knowing that they're getting a placebo and they have no chance of getting better? You're going to feel pretty, pretty bad about it, right? And you might treat those kids differently than you treat the ones that you know are receiving the actual drug and have a chance of getting better. But you can't do that because what if by being a little bit nicer to those kids or giving them an extra lollipop or something, what if that affects the results, okay? You're not treating all of the experimental units the same at that point, okay? The reason I need to not know which drug I'm getting is because of the placebo effect. The placebo effect can't be measured out if I know I'm getting a placebo, right? But it's equally important in most cases for the person administering the treatment to not know which treatment you're getting. Um, one potential weakness in experiments is a lack of realism. What this means is that the experimental environment may not be able to accurately reflect the environment that we want to study. So there are a couple examples I want to read you um, out of the old book, so I'm just going to read to you. One says, a study of the effects of marijuana recruited young men who used marijuana. Some were randomly assigned to smoke marijuana cigarettes, while others were given placebo cigarettes. This failed because the control group realized that their cigarettes were phony and they began to complain. Okay, so they couldn't actually test the placebo effect here because the experimental units knew who was getting the drug and who was getting the placebo. Um, so it says it may be quite common for double blindness to fail because the subjects can tell which treatment they're receiving. Another example says a study compares two television advertisements by showing TV programs to student subjects. The students know it's just an experiment, so we can't be sure that the results apply to everyday television viewers. Basically, they're watching TV advertisements in a lab, and you're not going to react the same way as you would if you were sitting on your couch watching the advertisement. So just because an experiment seems statistically significant does not mean that we can generalize the results to other contexts. That's actually the end of this chapter. So here's homework number four. And I, I'll come back to this, but I want number four back up in just a second. But I want to uh, give you guys some updated dates. I did go ahead and edit this video to make sure these dates were accurate because, again, we're not doing a, a cumulative exam at the end of this nine weeks because the nine weeks is pretty much over. So on Monday, what you guys are going to do is a practice quiz on section 5.2. I don't feel that there's been enough class time or opportunities for clarification on this section. And so that's what you're going to do on Monday. I'm also going to have a short review video to just remind you of all of the vocabulary that you're responsible for. Because on Tuesday of next week, I believe that's October 20th, that is your Chapter 5 test. Okay, so Tuesday of next week is when you're going to take a test on this chapter. It is not a mathy chapter, as you can see. This is a lot of vocabulary that you really, really, really need to know. Uh, on Wednesday, you're going to have time to work on that study guide. On Thursday, you're also going to be given time to work on it, but it is due on Thursday. So that study guide is due next Thursday. And remember, it is optional, and if you complete it completely, you get a 50 out of 50 test grade, which can really bring your grade up pretty significantly. All right, then Friday, there is no school. That's a teacher work day. It gives us time to get our grades in. Then the weekend happens, and on Monday, uh, uh, the following Monday, the second nine weeks begins, and we will move into the next chapter. Uh, that is also set to be the day that I come back to work. So unless something has changed, um, as a reminder, I'm making these videos over the summer. I haven't even had the baby yet at this point. Um, so things can 
obviously change, but the plan is that I come back the first day of the second nine weeks, uh, which is a week from Monday. So take a look at these dates. Make sure you understand all of those uh, requirements. Let me go ahead and put homework number four back up for you here.